Hello, everyone, and welcome to another episode of the Wise Decision Maker Show, where we help you make the wisest and most profitable decisions. My name is Dr. Gleb Sapurski. I'm the CEO of Disaster Avoidance Experts, the future of work consultancy that sponsors the Wise Decision Maker Show. And today with me is Jonathan Sidarf, the CEO and co-founder of Turing AI. And Jonathan, would you tell us about what Turing AI does? Great. It's great to meet you, uh, Dr. Gleb. Uh, I'm Jonathan Sidarf, CEO and co-founder of Turing. Uh, which is Turing.com. Um, so um, at Turing, our mission is to use AI to unleash the world's untapped human potential. And we believe that uh, traditional recruiting, traditional ways of building engineering teams is over. Um, it's um, if, you, if you look at the traditional model, whether it's working with a tech services company or a labor marketplace or a recruiting firm, you find that when you're building an engineering team, it's super slow for starters. It takes mm -hmm. weeks and months. Um, and often it's because most of these uh, uh, platforms uh, tap into a very limited talent pool. Mm -hmm. And second, there's very shallow vetting. Like when you when you are uh, looking to find the, the, the right engineer or the right engineering team, uh, often to find one engineer, you have to interview like 30 people. Um, mm -hmm. And third, after you found that perfect team, there are very little controls on productivity, quality, et cetera, after you've put the team in place. So we asked ourselves, what if we could solve all of this with an AI first talent cloud? What if you could push a button to spin up your engineering team as easily as you'd spin up servers on AWS? And what if you had AI powered deep vetting and matching to automatically vet developers at scale from a global talent pool and, and match them with the right opportunities? And what if you had good controls for productivity, security, compliance after the match, right? This is why we built Turing. It's the world's most deeply vetted developers and teams uh, matched by AI. The company became a unicorn um, uh, very, re very recently. Uh, more recently. Reasons. Thank you. More recently, we've been raising at a, at a 4 billion valuation cap. And um, we have some wonderful clients today like Disney, Johnson & Johnson, Rivian, et cetera, building on top of Turing. Hmm. Um, and it's awesome to have like about 2 million developers signed up on Turing today. So it's been a fun, <laughs> fun journey so far. Hmm. Sounds like a fun journey. Now, one of the challenges that, of course, is happening with development is thinking about hybrid work and remote work. Yeah. How do you see developer teams that are hired for fully remote positions being hired effectively? What do you need to think about versus hiring them for hybrid positions versus fully office-centric positions? So can you lay those three distinct areas out for me. Yeah. So you mentioned remote, uh, hybrid, and, and fully fully office-based. Um, I think the first step is to be very intentional about what job can be done in a fully remote mm -hmm. fashion um, versus what job uh, needs to be done in an office. Mm -hmm. um, and I would make a distinction also in remote between remote centralized and remote distributed. Mm -hmm. Remote centralized being you have a team still in an office, but perhaps in a different, uh, a more cost efficient uh, uh, location than say uh, in the Bay Area, uh, or do you actually mean fully distributed where there is no office, everybody's collaborating as a distributor, right? I think that what the pandemic showed us is that for a vast, vast majority of jobs, a distributed team is a good default. And mm -hmm. I would emphasize the word default. Like I don't mean a distributed team never gets together and meets each other. I think there's a lot of value in meeting as needed, mm -hmm. but, uh, but a distributed team is a great uh, default. Um, mm -hmm. So definitely for software engineering jobs, uh, for software engineering roles, I think we've reached a stage where you can work in Silicon Valley without needing to live in Silicon Valley which is going to be wonderful for people all over the US like who are not sort of living between San Francisco to San Jose. Sure. I think the opportunity radius is going to expand for, for talented people. It's also amazing for people all over the world to, to participate in, in, in Silicon Valley and the incredible wealth creation that we see. So software engineering, I think, is, is one, row, one sector that I mm -hmm. think a distributed team absolutely is the right way to go. I do feel there is still value even in a even in software engineering teams for um, 
some level of um, uh, like being in broadly the same time zone or close to the same geographic area mm -hmm. at the very senior leadership levels. Right. Okay. Um, I, I think there is some value there. One thing I found fascinating is that they they used to be this myth that a sales team, for example, uh, do they have to be in an office or do they have to be distributed? Um, I think pre-pandemic, there was this the prevailing wisdom in Silicon Valley was a sales team has to be in the same office to feel the same energy. Hmm. On it. But the thing that we've all realized and we've realized firsthand at Turing is that even with a sales team, a distributed team works, a remote team, a remote distributed team works. Um, as long as you have like a a good cadence of quarterly meetups um, <laughs> in person for training, onboarding, uh, things like that. Um, there are probably some jobs that are more hardware oriented. If you're building cars, if you're building smartphones, if you're building, maybe if you're building rockets, like there, there might be uh, a reason to actually stay close to the hardware. Like I feel like uh, for those jobs, I think an office oriented job makes sense. I, so I would not say remote work is the norm for every company. I do think it's the norm for almost all software only companies. Hmm. Now, I help 23 companies transition to hybrid work, remote work, figuring out the return to office if they're deciding on rem um, hybrid work. And a number of software company leaders who I talk to express concerns about collaboration and innovation if their teams don't work in an office. What would you tell them? So I think the key to collaboration and innovation is um, having good systems for communication mm -hmm. and aligning people around priorities and goals. Mm -hmm. And I think the thing that a distributed team forces you to do is to be excellent at communication mm -hmm. uh, at a company-wide level. Mm -hmm. uh, communication was always really important, but a distributed team really helps you build that muscle. Yeah. For example, at Turing, um, we think very intentionally about um, what are our uh, OKRs for the quarter? What is our mm -hmm. product roadmap for the quarter? How do we document our product roadmap? How do we document our progress towards that product roadmap? In an office-only culture, you might get away with not good asynchronous communication. You'll just mm -hmm. bring some people together and talk about it. People will remember maybe 50% of what's discussed or less, and maybe some of it will get actioned on. But a remote distributed team helps you like level up your communication game, if you will. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I think um, both collaboration as well as innovation is just solved with really excellent communication and alignment on goals. And mm -hmm. it just forces managers to be um, much better managers in, in, in many mm -hmm. ways. Like the, um, that's what I see. I do feel like that it's true that um, one thing that becomes challenging in a distributed team is forming authentic relationships with your people. Mm -hmm. um, for, like for a manager, um, it, it is important to build uh, an authentic relationship based on trust um, mm -hmm. with their reports, with their peers. And that can get challenging in a distributed team. But the mitigation for that is being intentional about bringing people together on a cadence. Mm -hmm. Remote work does not mean you never meet. Th that's sure. silly, right? Of course you have to meet. Of course you have to build relationships. For example, I have some one-on-ones in person. We have a cadence in which we bring um, our uh, senior leadership team together, our exec team together. Mm -hmm. So, so you, have to, you have to put in the work to build those relationships. So I would say, a, um, I mean, much like there are bad office cultures, there are also bad remote cultures, Sure, it's up to the managers and leaders and, and employees in the company to make sure that um, you're thinking through the communication architecture the right way and thinking mm -hmm. through the human relationships uh, the right way and being intentional um, ab about solving for that. I would bet on a high performance uh, distributed team to outperform an, uh, an office team a, all day long. Like hmm. you benefit from firstly, like uh, casting a wider uh, net in terms of the uh, uh, talent radius that you're that you're able to attract. Um, 
for, for example, if I have, if, if let's say there is company A that is based in, uh, let's say San Francisco and says they're only gonna recruit people who live 15 minutes from the office, who can commute nine to five and come work uh, in their office in San Francisco and company B that says, hey, we're gonna recruit the best people across America, across the world. You can be in Ohio, you can be in New York, you can be in San Diego, but we just want the best people. And mm -hmm. we are gonna to get together periodically as needed. Uh, we, we have really good uh, communication um, uh, alignment systems at work. And I would put this question to you, Dr. Gleb, like, um, like wh where, I mean, which, com which company is more likely to attract great people? Like somebody who's, I mean, if you sample it at random, one company that looked for people who happened to live 15 minutes from the office versus another company that uh, said across America, all good, across the world, all good, which company is going to have better talent? Yeah, I put that question often to the leaders I work with to try yeah. to help them see that if they want good talent and yeah. also don't want to pay for the cost of living in San Francisco, which is another consideration, yeah. that is yeah. definitely something to think about. Now, yeah. it's the difference, between, think... like a, it's the difference between like a, a, a city team versus a national team that's representing Olympics, <laughs> right? Like which that. is going to be better. <laughs> yeah, I like that. I like that analogy. Now, as we're seeing the rise of generative AI, what I am think will happen, and I'm curious what you think will happen, is that that will facilitate more remote work, remote work and hybrid work, because it will make it easier for people to communicate more effectively. I, as you said, communication is the basis for collaboration and for innovation. And I see generative AI as facilitating more effective communication, therefore, decreasing the need for the office that previously was felt by some people who said, well, I need an office for collaboration and innovation. But if you have generative AI that facilitates your collaboration, your innovation, your information sharing, what are your thoughts about that? That, that is super interesting, Dr. Glab. So you, I think you're on to something that generative AI will really um, up-level communication. And I can see a few ways in which generative AI, particularly impacting communication in a remote distributed or a hybrid team. Mm -hmm. um, I think one thing that has happened, this is like a, a, a quiet revolution that sort of happened without us paying attention to it, which is all meetings today are Zoom meetings by default. Mm -hmm. This is something that we would not have taken into account pre-pandemic. Sure. And this has an important implication, which is if it's a Zoom meeting, just like this conversation you and I are having, it can be recorded. Mm -hmm. And if it can be recorded, it can be transcribed. If it can be transcribed, it can be summarized and indexed and made searchable. And if it can be summarized and indexed, like I can absolutely imagine you and I having a conversation where we automatically get a summary of what questions did Dr. Gleb ask? What mm -hmm. questions did, uh, what, how did Jonathan respond to that? What were the key points from the conversation? And I can imagine me sharing that email automatically perhaps with our exec team, right? Mm -hmm. And to your point about ensuring more lossless communication, uh, I think like, I, I, I think like, uh, I think generative AI uh, and, and a lot of uh, machine learning, to be honest, uh, will help. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, probably also being more proactive in communication. Like if it were up to me, uh, I might think it's too much work to to synthesize exactly the key beats from this conversation and and share it share it with the right folks, but I can totally imagine an AI assistant telling me, "Hey, Jonathan, you discussed uh, uh, distributed teams versus hybrid teams versus in office teams with Dr. Club. You should share that with these five other clients, like who are who are also interested in that same topic. And maybe I look at the email that's already drafted. Maybe an AI has written." 80% of the email, I fix a few tweaks here and there, and then it goes out. Uh, I can imagine it helping there. Mm -hmm. So I, I'm, I'm, I think, I mean, I'm sure you might have seen like the Office uh, uh, 365 yes. uh, co-pilot uh, features. I think it's going to be wonderful for productivity. I think every human is going to be 10 to 100x uh, more productive. Yeah. And anything that massively improves communication is great for remote teams and distributed teams. Um, and it, it's such an exciting time. Like we are thinking about, for example, at Turing, 
ways yeah. in which um, uh, our sales conversations could be uh, more efficiently tracked, automated uh, in terms of how we capture data, how we update uh, databases like uh, Salesforce. Um, so, so I think you're onto something. I think generative AI like is going to be a big tailwind for um, for uh, communication, which will which will again lift all boats as it relates to uh, remote work. And to come back to what Turing does, how do you think AI, generative AI, this version, other generative AI varieties will impact hiring, both of remote developers, non-remote developers? What do you think will be the impact there? What do you see as the future? Yeah, so I'm I'm gonna I'm gonna take your uh, question in uh, in in three parts in terms of what what does this mean mean for Turing? This is something that me and our exec team spend quite a bit of time thinking through. So the first part is what does it mean for our clients? Right. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, I believe. AI transformation is the new digital transformation. So every company is going to become an AI company, or I should say most companies are going to become AI companies in some way, shape, or form. For some companies, it'll represent an existential threat. In some companies, it'll it'll represent a massive, massive opportunity. But every company is going to be, have to come up with an AI strategy. Like every CEO is probably asking their exec team, okay, what does this chat GPT moment mean for us, Right. And we are noticing that different companies are at different levels of maturity in leveraging AI. Um, there are some companies that first need to get started with ensuring that their app is architected the right way mm. to collect the right data, to train machine learning models, making sure you have the right uh, cloud backend, the right data analytics backend. Uh, so at Turing, we are, uh, we've launched um, a, an AI practice, including an AI mm. advisory to help companies make that make that journey to get to, mm. to get to get to where they where they want to go right so ai transformation is is the is the new digital transformation and we see among our clients including johnson and johnson disney uh, rivian a wide variety of industries are getting transformed by ai storytelling is going to be yeah. transformed by ai the way we make movies is going to get transformed the way we do uh, drug discovery is going to be transformed the way medical dis diagnosis happens is going to be transformed at Turing, we've actually shared our uh, shared a few white papers on what chat GPT means for healthcare, what it means for mm -hmm. banking, what it means for retail. And we've shared our point of view. So we are seeing a massive influx in demand for AI engineers and AI engineering teams. So that's one trend that's happened. A, a lot of demand uh, with all the wonderful work that OpenAI and many other folks in the industry have sort of unlocked. The second thing that we are seeing is there is a lot of excitement for developers to start using these tools to become more productive. Yeah. So I I, I believe that we, we're about to see the era of a software engineer who's 10 to 100x more productive, right? Mm. That's gonna be wonderful for the world. I don't think uh, we can fully fathom what a 100x software engineer looks like. <laughs> because when that happens, like we, it's gonna be like, it's going to be like being a kid during Halloween. It'll be <laughs> wonderful products, wonderful apps. Products improve yeah. at such an insane velocity. And we'll see new new drugs discovered, new <laughs> cures discovered. It's going to be a golden era for humanity. Um, but it starts with generative AI, like amplifying the productivity of a developer. <laughs> so at Turing, we, are, we want to help every software engineer uh, get the benefit of what we call an AI-powered exoskeleton. Um, mm. So we are uh, thinking about um, how we're going to train developers, get them ready, what tools and workflows do we build for developers to thrive in this AI era. Mm. Right. So so, um, uh, so we are launching, uh, we're, we're doing some initiatives to uh, help the 2 million developers on Turing become AI-enhanced, right? Uh, we envision a future where clients will can choose between having a human developer or what we call a Turing developer, somebody mm -hmm. who's an indistinguishable mix of human and AI who, who's that much more leveraged. Right? We might have a picture of, uh, you know, maybe a maybe a um, like a like a developer in an Iron Man or Iron Woman suit <laughs> versus versus a more regular human, right? Um, and we think more and more uh, clients will opt for 
AI enhanced developers rather than mm -hmm. let's call it a, a classic uh, classic developer. So that's the second theme. Like I think mm -hmm. we're seeing a lot of interest and excitement among developers to mm -hmm. take advantage of these new new tools to be more productive, more effective. Um, the uh, the third interesting um, idea up here is I think it changes um, how you evaluate a, a software engineer. Uh, mm -hmm. For example. I saw a research uh, paper uh, about how um, some of these new uh, LLMs are able to pass uh, a software engineering interview at um, at a Google level, like like an oh. like somebody who's interviewing at Google, like like the classic sort of coding problems challenges you would you would give them. It was passing it at a at a pretty high level. It, it, so the the provocative headline was, okay, AI is good enough to get a job at Google. Right mm -hmm. now, it's 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 kind of tongue in cheek because it's AI might be good enough to get a job at Google, but AI is not there to do the job at Google today. Sure, like we're far from that, right? And I feel like it speaks a lot to how we thought about evaluating software engineers. Yeah. And I, I so at Turing we are thinking about like we are constantly at the forefront of how do we use machine learning to evaluate software engineers at scale mm -hmm. in a way that's um, that accurately reflects their ability to excel on the job. Mm -hmm. And I think in the past, we've been doing like these, um, we, we've been taking some shortcuts. When I say we, I mean, as an industry, we've been taking some shortcuts in terms of how we've evaluated software engineers bef before. And some of these AI-based systems are showing us the the, the shortcomings and, and sort of the gaps mm -hmm. to vetting. Uh, if an AI can pass the vetting, but not do yeah. the job. Right? Like the, yeah. so I think we're we're about to see some interesting innovation. Uh, Turing's going to be uh, uh, going to be at the forefront of of many of that in terms of evaluating software engineers for the AI era, mm -hmm. um, and this also includes. I think, I think in the future, every software engineer can, is going to work alongside an AI. Like a, mm -hmm. there's going to be an AI based pair programmer that every engineer is about to have, um, and. Uh, I, I think as the day to day of a software engineer changes, we have to adapt how we evaluate a software engineer uh, when mm. when you're hiring an engineer and when you're evaluating their performance on an ongoing basis. So those mm. are the, the the three sort of um, ways uh, ways I think about it. But what a what an exciting time! It's really an exciting time, and I'm glad that you shared where how you're thinking about this in the company. What are as we're wrapping up? Are there any last words with which you wish to leave our audience? Yeah, uh, thank you, Dr. Glab. And if you are uh, building an engineering team um, to to build your product roadmap, um, I'd encourage you to look at Turing.com. We offer the world's most deeply vetted developers and teams matched by AI. And our clients use Turing in two ways, either to um, augment an existing team or to build an entire team. Um, and we, uh, we, we are also launching um, specific services around AI, cloud, and application uh, engineering. So I encourage uh, people building engineering teams who value high quality while also being efficient uh, to check out uh, Turing. And thank you for inviting me to be on, be, on, be on your show. Thank you for coming, Jonathan. And thank you to the audience for checking out another episode of the Wise Decision Maker Show. Please make sure to subscribe wherever you checked out the show and leave a review. It helps others discover the show and it helps us improve the show. All right, everyone. I look forward to seeing you next episode of the Wise Decision Maker Show. In the meantime, the wisest and most profitable decisions to you, my friends. Thank you, Dr. Glenn. Hmm.